Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Linscott. I am uh, a part of the Plano Public Library staff in the Outreach and Engagement Department. I um, want to thank you all for joining us for today's program. Uh, please note that if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat and then we'll be monitoring the chat. Sabrina is with us today to monitor the chat and assist you with any issues um, that you may have, bring questions to our attention. And we'll also be sure to leave time for questions uh, throughout the presentation. Um, just a couple of housekeeping reminders for you. Um, please note that this program is being recorded and it will be made available on the Plano Public Library YouTube page for later viewing. Also of note, um, soliciting business or selling merchandise during library virtual programs is prohibited. Please show respect for our presenters and for one another throughout the program. I am certain that you will do that. So we are so happy to have with us today, Erin Hoffer with the City of Plano Sustainability and Environmental Education Division. When asked what she does for a living, Erin quips that she gets paid to play in the dirt with worms and, she, and to encourage others to do the same thing as often as possible. She is delighted to combine her love of gardening and her love of education into a full-time vocation as an environmental educator and a part-time avocation as a master gardener and a master composter volunteer. We are so happy to have Erin with us today. I know that you will enjoy the presentation. Um, so thank you so much, Erin, and let's get started. Thank you for inviting me. So that I'm always interested to know about people's gardening. So um, I know that you all have a chat box. And if you would think for a moment, what is your biggest challenge in the shade garden? What is the thing that you struggle with the most? I'm hopeful that by the time we come to the end of our session, you will have some answers. So what is it? Is it that your plants are too small? Um, you don't have, you have too many leaves and not enough blossoms. Uh, you don't have much color in your shade garden. Are you struggling with turf or too much bare ground? Um, are you are you just at the point where you don't know what to do, <laughs> which is often the case? Um, let me know what your biggest challenge is. Okay, so I'm seeing soil erosion under a magnolia tree. Okay, that can part of that could be that there is um, uh, that you're not getting enough light uh, to have turf underneath there, and you might need to be looking for ways to address it. Uh, trying to find good options for limited sun, container gardening, and an east exposure balcony. Oh, we're going to be talking about exposures, like where the light uh, falls. So definitely pay attention to that section. Um, I, I'm seeing a couple of you are saying uh, more color, please more color. Rabbits, okay, I'm sorry, but rabbits are just a fact of life in our, our uh, uh, part of Texas, unfortunately. Uh, large trees where grass doesn't thrive at the edges of the yard. Yes, that, that is a common problem. And in fact, the reason I developed this presentation a number of years ago was because in my regular gardening classes, people were bringing these exact same parts of the uh, problems and looking for solutions. And it suddenly occurred to me, we are a mature city. We have mature landscapes with mature trees. And, and a lot of people are struggling with shade. So um, I am looking down the list. Okay, a lot of these things that you all are putting in here are things that we are going to touch on today. So thank you for sharing that with me. So we're going to talk about uh, gardens that are made in the shade and particularly um, plants that are shade tolerant for our area. And so the first thing we have to talk about is the 50 shades of day. And that's because um, there are just so many different uh, degrees of light or lack of light in our yards. And often we don't actually know how much light is in our yard and what to do about it. So when we talk about um, what is a shade garden, um, we say that first and foremost, it's an area where they have little 
or no direct light. And the key word there is direct light because you can have filtered light, you can have reflected light, but in a shade garden, there's usually little or no direct light on the plants. Uh, often it is under trees or it's next to some sort of a permanent or semi-permanent structure like a home, a building, a fence. Um, and usually those gardens are ornamental. And part of the reason they're ornamental, uh, not only for our aesthetic pleasure, but because uh, vegetable gardens, uh, the crops that we most enjoy growing require eight or 10 uh, hours of sunlight. And you're not going to find that in a uh, shade garden. So uh, it might be fragrance oriented, could be medicinal. Not very often is it herbs because herbs as a general rule um, like a lot of light. So it tends to be an ornamental uh, type garden. When we uh, talk about light, there are so many different labels. And I think most people could determine what is full sun and what is full shade. But most of us aren't in that situation. We are somewhere in between in that spectrum of light uh, and, and shade in the garden. And it makes it a bit of a challenge to know which plants to choose so that they will be successful. So one of the things that I like to talk about with folks is um, not the not the shade part, but the light part. And when it comes uh, to light, next to cold hardiness, light is the most critical element affecting plant choice because the plants use that light for photosynthesis so that they can produce food and energy uh, that they need to live and grow and flower. And in a shady environment, that occurs at a much lower rate. So talking about photosynthesis, let's go back to second grade for a moment here. It is the reaction that takes place between carbon dioxide and water, and the catalyst, uh, the catalyst is uh, sunlight. It's, it's the energy that helps the plant to produce glucose or sugar and a waste product that we call oxygen. So um, that chlorophyll, which is a component in the leaves, absorbs light. And in particular, it absorbs red light and blue light and um, that is an important piece of information for you as a gardener because that blue light and that uh, red light each have a um, play a different role in how plants develop. So there's three uh, types of or three characteristics of light that matter to us as gardeners. And the first is what we call light intensity. And really that's just saying how bright is it and how direct is that sunlight? Because that changes throughout the day and it changes throughout the course of the year. Think about what the light quality is like in the early, early morning versus noon. Big difference. Also think about right now, we're kind of coming out of winter and we've had a much softer and weaker light compared to what we have in the summertime. So light intensity is definitely one of the things that we need to pay attention to um, in our gardens when we're trying to figure out what's the light situation for our plants. And the highest time of intensity is in the summer and the lowest is in the winter time. But even the position of the sun itself changes. Notice the difference between where the sun is directly overhead in the summertime and it's more at an angle, a lower angle in the sky in the winter time. Um, now a lot of us have plants that are perennials and so they're asleep during the winter and that's less of a concern. That's why we pay attention in particular to the summer sunlight. Another quality or characteristic that we care about is the quality of the color of light. And even though we can't perceive light, I mean, to, to us, it's just a white light, but plants can tell um, or plants can perceive the difference. And so the sunlight has a full spectrum from violet to red in uh, wavelengths that are short to long. And the, what matters to us is that the blue light is important for what we call vegetative development or the development of the leaves. And red light is key for flowering. 
So if you're looking at um, your yard, your, your shade garden, and you have really, really big leaves that you're getting a fair amount of blue light, even though it's in the shade. Uh, but if you are have a scarcity of flowers, it's usually because there's not a lot of red light. Now, I shared this with a class one night, and a lady suddenly shouted from the back of the classroom, now I get it. I said, okay, do share. Uh, and she said, we bought two plants, exactly the same. We put them in two containers. We put them on either side of our a table outside and we couldn't figure out why one of them uh, was flowering but had smaller leaves and the other one had huge leaves and no flowers. Turned out that she had a, an umbrella and the umbrella was blue. And so one of the plants was getting a lot of sunlight from that blue light um, in the uh, umbrella and the other one wasn't as much under the umbrella so it was getting more red light and therefore it was flowering so we talked a little bit about okay so now that you know that what can you do or, or or what do you want to do and she said well i'm going to go home and i'm going to switch those two pots and keep rotating them so that both of them get nice big leaves but they also have flowers uh, by allowing both of them to have a red light so it does matter now in that case because it was a container it was a very easy problem to solve that is not necessarily the case for things that are in the ground but it is important to understand that um, just because you don't have flowers doesn't mean you did something wrong uh, it just is there's not enough red light. I, I did have somebody one time ask me, she said, I'm, I'm fertilizing and I'm putting out all the fertilizer to make it flower and I'm just not getting anything. Turned out it was just too shady and it just wasn't getting enough red light. So look at the difference here in these uh, Rudbeckias or the Black Eyed Susans. You can see the one on the left is in the shade and it has nice big green leaves getting lots of blue light. But look at the one that was in full sun that's getting its share of red light. Look at the difference in the blossoms. So uh, if you have a lot of trees, there your options may be limited, but it's always important to understand what is nature trying to tell you and how being able to interpret that information will help you to be a more successful gardener. Another characteristic is light duration, and that is the length of light exposure. And it's typically the way that we measure shade is how long is the light on that area. Now, you can actually measure the light, and there's a couple of different ways that you can do it. One of those ways is that you can do what we call um, a monitoring map. And so you simply go out and um, you create a little chart. You start it um, at between 10 o'clock in, in the morning and six o'clock at night is the critical time. But I would suggest going out as soon as the light is available to you. And you have a little chart and you just check, yes, there's light, no, there's not light. And then you can count up the hours. Not only does it matter the number of hours, but it also matters the time of day that that light is falling on the plant. So you can see from this one that there is morning light, but there is afternoon shade. And that at least the eight o'clock and nine o'clock hours are going to be very soft and not very intense light, but 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock are intense light. So um, this is some very basic information on what is going on in the garden, but you can get more detailed. This is a sample of a map. And in the map, they have actually mapped out where the plants are and then where the shadows fall at the different times of day. Now, if they were trying to put in a vegetable garden, the best place to put in the vegetable garden, according to this map, is kind of right smack dab in the middle where the key is, because that's the one place where there's not a lot of shade. So it does take time, but you don't have to be a great artist. You can just do it in circles and uh, approximate. But I love that they put in uh, for the noon time versus the afternoon time so that they have a pretty good idea of when they're um, putting out new plants, uh, what the light situation is going to be.
Now, you can also purchase a light meter. Uh, this is usually the season that they're in the garden centers, but you can buy them online at any time. Uh, this one happens to be uh, in the photograph, a combination meter. And you can see that there's a little slide at the bottom to allow it to switch from measuring the pH or the, how acid or alkaline the soil is, um, the moisture in the soil, and then how much light is in a particular area. But um, even if you don't feel like spending $15 or $20 for it, you can also download some apps and use the light meter that exists on your phone. And so uh, what I like about these two, uh, the one on the left is MQ Sum. Uh, green thumb, and it is only for iPhones, sorry folks, and then the other one is Planto. Uh, there may be other ones since I updated this last year. If there are, please let me know if you know of one. What I like about them is that they uh, give you a fairly good idea of uh, what kind of light there is. It's really quick. Most of us have our phones in our pockets. We can take a quick reading at different times during the day. The other thing is that both apps have databases of plants uh, attached to them so that you can uh, find out what the lighting situation is and then look up recommended plants. The only criticism I have is that they are not Texas specific plants. So just because it's recommended in the database, you need to also cross check and see if it does well here in our part of Texas. Now this is a sample of a light study and that's a way to track light across the arc of a day. It's best done between 10 o'clock and 6 o'clock and preferably in the summertime because that is when your trees are going to be at maximum canopy. They're going to have the most number of leaves and they're going to be casting the most shadows. But it's also the time of year when the most sunshine is available. So doing a light study like this um, in, in the wintertime is not going to help you very much. Doing it in the spring might be a little uh, premature. Doing it in the fall, um, for the most part, the at least the trees will be out. Uh, with the leaf, you won't maybe have as many hours of light or as many minutes of light. But I always tell folks, if you can get it somewhere around the, the vernal equinox, which is around the 20th of June, that's really the best time to do it. So mark your calendars now and um, you can set up for a light study. Now this is a sample of a light study one of the Plano HOAs uh, had done. They were in the process of uh, renovating the entrance to their housing addition. And so in order for me to help them uh, with plant selection, I asked them to go out every hour on the hour and take a photograph. And um, some folks are a little resistant. They're like, oh, that's a lot of work. And it's like, well, it is a lot of work in a sense, but it also gives you a lot of information and helps you make better plant choices. So um, when we got this back and we laid all of the photographs out, you can see that eight o'clock and nine o'clock, we had very soft light, but it is light. 10 and 11, 12, one o'clock actually a cloud was in the area. So they actually have six, almost seven hours of light between eight o'clock and two o'clock. But once we hit three o'clock, the nearby tree started casting shadows. So we made sure that we selected plants that were appropriate for the situation where they were going to be in the shade um, for um, about half of the afternoon. So they needed to be a little more light tolerant. And we went with uh, plants that were uh, lean, lean towards the partial shade because that really was the situation here. Now, there is one other test that you can do, and I do recommend it if you have uh, expensive plants that you're going to put out. These are petunias, and they cost about $4, um, uh, four, four to $8 for a flat, depending on how many is in the flat. And the thing about petunias is they're light sensitive, and they grow best in full sunlight. Uh, they will tolerate a light shade, and when it's in light shade, they kind of get tall and spindly. They sort of lean towards where the light is. So I tell folks, you can, you can get several and put them in the area where you think you're going to put your new plants, your new expensive plants. If the petunias do really well, well, it's a full sun situation, or at least it's enough sun to make a petunia happy, and you might want to rethink your plant selection. 
Um, if it's kind of the tall and spindly, it's probably a partial light. And if the petunia just flats out, flat out dies within about 10 days, um, a, you're in a shade situation. And uh, as much as I don't enjoy killing plants, uh, it's a good test rather than putting um, 30, 40, 50 dollars worth of plants in there and then finding out that they're not happy. Uh, you can do a petunia test. So how are you going to measure light? So stop for a moment and think about that. Which of those methods is something that you can work into your schedule kind of uh, in a couple of months here? All right, let's see if we got any questions. Uh, perennial shade plants that survive in Texas heat. Carol, you are in luck because I am going to give you some recommendations. Uh, some color, mm, some of them do have color, uh, but we're also going to talk about instead of depending on plants for color, we're going to talk about other ways to get color into your yard that are just as effective without having to depend on the plants. Uh, plant recommendations for evergreen foundation plants that can handle full shade in the winter and five hours of morning sun in the summer. Rachel, we might have some for you um, when we're talking about ground covers and when we're talking about shrubs, so pay attention to that. All right, so we do define shade as um, being measured between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. in the summertime. Now, I love this diagram from Texas A&M uh, that talks about the amount of sun for each of the plants. So direct sun is obviously sun all the time on uh, all day long. Partial sun is um, most of the day, but a couple of hours of a little bit of shade. Partial shade is a little more shade. Full shade is when you don't have any direct sun, but you can have bright or indirect light or reflected light in that area. And then the final one is dense shade. That means there's no direct sun and there's no uh, bright or reflected light. Well, what does that look like? So let's uh, look at some real life examples. Here is a full sun garden. This was on our tour, uh, Waterwise Landscape Tour a couple of years ago. Look at all the gorgeous colors that are there. This is direct light, no, no filters at all, at least six hours of the, of the day. And there's all kinds of beautiful color, blossoms, and leaves. But if you are here, you probably are not dealing with that. And you probably have something that is a little more like this, which is what we call partial uh, sun or light shade. And that is when uh, often there's like a structure that is providing uh, a light part of the day and it's casting a significant sized shadow. Uh, it may also be a situation where you have a light pattern of shade. Um, maybe you have young trees or maybe like this one where you see the desert willow that has a very open canopy and very small leaves. Uh, and about four to six hours of sunlight a day. Partial shade, or what we call sometimes filtered shade, is when it receives um, about maybe six hours of direct light, but four of those are in the morning. So remember, that's that less intense time of sunshine. It also can have... Um, when the sunlight filters through uh, tree canopies as well. So it's, it's somewhere around a good three to four hours of light. Now this is more like full shade and full shade is when it is um, no direct sunlight, but you can have reflected light. This also is one of the yards that was on a tour that we had uh, several years ago. And this was in the backyard. And as you can see, the entire backyard is full of trees. It was a bird sanctuary. And they had beautiful water. But right to the uh, right side, just outside of the frame of the picture, was a their two-story homes. There really wasn't any light that was coming down into this area. And they had lots and lots of shade coming from the tree. So this is a full shade situation. Uh, 
And then this is a dense uh, situation in which there's not even direct sunlight and very, very little reflected light. Uh, think deep, dark, primeval forest. Uh, not something that we see a lot around here in Plano. So which type of shade do you have? Because there are two pieces that you need to think about. What's happening in the morning in your garden and what's happening in the afternoon in your garden. And so uh, there are some situations where you have morning sun and you have afternoon shade. Now, some of the characteristics of that are it is cooler. Um, because the sun comes up, uh, the dew has a tendency to dry quickly, but the light that is coming up is less intense, and this spends a, um, a good amount of time uh, in the evening, in the um, in the in the late in the late part of the day, uh, in the shade. So it 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 holds that. Um, that coolness for a lot longer period of time. If that is what you are looking at, then the plants that you need to be considering are the ones that are full shade plants that will tolerate partial shade. Uh, you can't go wrong because if you buy a full shade plant, uh, unless it's a full shade and they say, you know, no tolerance at all, because some plants don't have um, a wide range of the amount of light that they can tolerate. Uh, most plants, though, that are full to partial shade, they do have a bit of a range. So those are the ones you need to be looking at. And this is um, an example of one. It is a holly fern. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, here in a moment when we talk about plant selection. The flip side to that is when you have morning shade and afternoon sun. Now, that tends to be more humid, and that's because there's a longer period of time uh, throughout the day when it is holding on to the water or the transpiration the, that it has given up. Um, the dew dries a lot more slowly. That's because you're, uh, there's a long period of time in the morning uh, in which it sits in the shade and the sun is not hitting it yet to have it dry up. It usually has uh, uh, less light than full sun and when the light does fall on it, it is greater light intensities. Think the end of the summer, uh, those last rays before the evening. And so in that case, what you are looking for are light shade to full sun plants. So looking for full sun plants that tolerate light shade. And uh, this American Beauty Berry is a good example of a full sun plant that will tolerate light shade. All right, so stop and think, what do you have? Do you have morning sun or do you have afternoon sun? Or do you, is your landscape such that you're actually struggling to deal with both of these? All right, let's see, potted plants, potted plants. I can jump onto those at the end. I don't see any other questions. Okay, so I am gonna go on. All right, so I did mention that depending on the color coming from the plants is there's other options and it's probably not your best strategy. You can afford to do that in a full sun situation, but in a shade situation, gardening where the sun doesn't shine, you've got to have some other moves, some other strategies. So let's talk about what those are. One of them is to put in a path. Um, if underneath your trees or in the shady part of your garden, you are struggling with mud, with bare ground, with um, turf that won't grow there, with patchy areas that you, it's just not working. Sometimes the best option is to put in hardscape, skip the softscape, the plants, and concentrate on the hardscape. And those are things like paths. So you can see here uh, in this area that's a partial shade that they have laid down stepping stones and then they have allowed some, uh, I think it's Creeping Jenny if I recall correctly, uh, which is a, a plant that does okay in the shade and it has filled in. But I have seen a beautiful garden that was a, a side yard that was an absolute 
mess of mud every time it rained turned into a beautiful little side shade garden once they put down a path and they started quit trying to deal with uh, making the grass grow where it didn't want to. Uh, speaking of turf, uh, we always recommend taking out turf whenever possible, uh, particularly in a shade situation. Think of your turf in your yard as a, an accent rug and not as wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Um, if it doesn't, if you can't get grass to grow there, uh, throwing down grass seed, putting out more water, uh, is not going or even more fertilizer is not going to fix the problem if there's not enough light and so um, I had a gentleman one time said what's the best kind of turf underneath a live oak and I said mulch and he said no no you don't understand and he explained the whole situation to him and I said yes sir I do understand and my answer remains the same mulch you're not going to be able to grow your turf. He, he had tried three times to grow turf in an area where it kept dying. Uh, if nature sends you the message, turf doesn't want to grow here, believe it. It's not going to grow there. Uh, yes, there are turfs that are shade tolerant, but keep in mind that is shade tolerant, not shade loving. Uh, so you again, knowing how much direct light is in there will help you to know, should I try one of the new varieties or should I just skip the turf and start using something else, like start using the plants. So this is an example of um, a Plano resident who was on our tour about uh, five years ago. The trees began, uh, had, had really matured. They had slowly begun to eat up the turf. The turf had begun to dry, die back over the years and they were really tired of a bare area. So instead, they put in shade-loving plants, they put in hardscape, uh, they have a little patio area with stone, and they have uh, a pathway leading up to it. And this is a lovely little uh, sitting area in the front of their home underneath the shade trees, just by taking out the turf. And it's still lush, it's still green, it's still attractive, the neighbors love it, they love stopping by and visiting. It was a much better choice than trying to make grass grow where it didn't want to. Now, one of the things that we forget about when we're designing our gardens is that texture and color are um, wonderful ways to uh, create visual interest. But sometimes we're limited in the color palette. And when that uh, occurs, using texture to entice the eye is a really good strategy. So you can see here that there's probably about five different textures. You've got broad leaves, you have needle-like leaves, um, you have very fine textured leaves, you have um, very gross textured leaves. So there's um, several different colors of green, there's some pops of yellow, and yet it's all very restful and still interesting and attractive to the eye, even though there's not reds and purples and pinks. So another thing, though, is that when you do have color options, go bright, go bold. So most often your choice is in a shade garden, uh, particularly in foliage, it's going to be many shades of green from dark to pale, plus whites, plus golds or yellows. And so if you take those and you combine them with uh, different textures of leaves, you can still create something that is attractive. Now, for some of you, you're going, no, 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 I still want color. There are some uh, plants, and I'll point them out here in a moment, that actually do well in shade. This uh, Turk's cap, which is the uh, a native to Texas, is uh, one of the prime examples. It does well both in full sun as well as in full shade and everywhere in between. And if you love hummingbirds, this is a great way to attract them to your yard. Uh, the red is the original. There are some other varieties. There's a white lightning. There, there's several of them that are white. And then there's a, a pink one called uh, Pam's Pink or Pam's pink per year, I think is the, the official name for it. But if they're, they're not going to be as vibrant, they're not going to uh, pop as much as if you have something that is red. Um, although I will say if you have 
deep shade, uh, a white would definitely pop against the dark uh, background there. Uh, the other thing about flowering shrubs is that they add visual height, they add texture as well as some limited color. So I encourage you to consider those. Now, one thing um, in the hardscape department is art. And this is a great way to show personality um, and, and personal interest. So it can be fun and quirky objects. It can be very elegant and classic, but it, it sort of imprints your personality on the landscape. And so you can see here, they went with sort of a light colored uh, sphere motif. And so they, they've got some silver ones, they've got some floating white ones, and they sort of echo the white uh, that is in the hosta leaves that are there. And they've even added that water garden, which adds some more interest. Now this example, is a bottle tree that was uh, one of the uh, homeowners that was on our tour was an artist a couple of years ago and she created this with some beautiful bottles and that is how she added uh, color to that kind of shady corner of their yard but she also added permanent color because she was a mosaic artist and she created tiles that even in the middle of winter um, added color to the brown mulch that uh, uh, was part of their landscape. And so as you walked into their uh, side yard, you immediately knew that an artist lives here. Uh, there's going to be beautiful color. There's going to be um, something exciting to look at. And uh, it was really funny because when I went to visit their home, uh, they're, they're friends of mine, and they were in the middle of trying to figure out what they were going to do for their renovation. Uh, I kind of listened to their plan and I said, well, can I offer you an observation? And she said, what is it? And I said, you have many beautiful pieces, but there's nothing about your home as people drive up to it that says an artist lives here. What if you rearranged some of those so that they were more prominent in the landscape so that people would immediately know someone who is an artist or someone who loves art lives here. And uh, that sort of helped to inspire them a little bit in the selections that they made both in the front yard, but also in the sides and the backyard. Now, this is another example of someone who used color. This ge uh, gentleman is a graphic artist for the city of Plano, and uh, John was kind enough to uh, be part of our tour about three years ago. And what I loved about visiting his yard was that uh, he used his uh, uh, his artist's eye to capitalize on, on accent color. Most of the time when I tell people, when you pick hardscape, such as chairs, um, and benches and, and pillows and things like that, don't pick the black ones. Go with the bright pink or the hot turquoise. Well, they actually selected the, br uh, the black as the furniture, but they accented it with this uh, brilliant red umbrella. And if I recall correctly, I think there's two of them in the yard. And so, um, the focal point is on that red. And then they echoed that color using temporary color, such as begonias. Now they collect um, uh, memorabilia from their travels. And so this um, corner uh, signpost was something that they brought home on their travels. And even though it's brown and it kind of blends in, um, it's the perfect place for hanging these colorful annual accents that are the red begonias. And they kind of echo that red color. I will say there is one bench in their yard uh, as you wander through the curving paths and you come around the curve and there is a bright red bench. So they, uh, they did actually um, use that color red in very uh, creative ways uh, in their garden. And then one last way to add temporary color is how you choose your containers. And I am a big advocate of containers because that's a place where you can put annuals. And um, even if your annuals have to sit in the shade, and maybe they're mostly green or white or yellow or gold, the container that they sit in doesn't have to be. And so you can put in color that lasts well beyond the season that is always out in your yard by picking the hardscape uh, for that color.
So stop for a moment and think about um, of the strategies I've mentioned, what's one that you can incorporate into your gardens? All right, so let me see what I've got here. Okay, so we've got some people that have morning sun on the balcony and afternoon sun on the front porch and all container gardening. So Josephine, that gives you lots and lots of options. Um, the other piece to it is that you also have the option that if a, a uh, because you have a morning sun on one side and an afternoon sun on the other and you have containers, uh, if if it's not doing well in one place, you can always swap it out to the other place, which is something you can't do if the plants are down in the ground. Is it necessary to repot a small plant with a water holder that you bought from Walmart? Uh, chances are fairly good if you are using containers. Yes, you're going to have to repot your plants as they grow. Does it have to be with the same type of um, container? No, it does not. There are strategies that you can use. Um, adding compost to it uh, will help uh, retain water. Um, also laying a layer of compost on the top will help not only feed the plant whenever you water it, but it will help to keep the water in the container. And again, it also depends on the type of container. If it's a terracotta container, um, my experience has been that they tend to dry out fairly quickly, whereas uh, plastic containers do not. So in this part of Texas, uh, if you want a um, terracotta container, buy a bigger one than what you need so that it doesn't dry out the roots uh, quite so quickly. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions, so I'm, I am going to uh, go on. And uh, yes, if yes. Help, if the holly fern is evergreen. I was just, I just saw that pop in and uh, we are going to talk about the holly fern. So um, we have plants that love the darker side of your yard, and we're going to talk about those. And uh, the first one is ground covers, and that includes lovely plants like this holly fern. So uh, bugleweed is one of my favorites. Uh, I've seen it used in uh, several yards here uh, that were on our Waterwise Landscape Tour. What I love about bugleweed is that it the leaves themselves come in a lot of different shades. And I believe, if I recall this one, I think it's called uh, Bronze Beauty because it's got that little kiss of bronze in the middle of it. You'll notice that there is kind of a darker green one at the bottom. Uh, I did not, in my other presentation, I actually made the an annotation, and I'm so sorry I did not on this one. But the reason that I do like them, aside from the fact that they are a great uh, dense ground cover that goes from partial shade to full shade. So those of you who have those um, morning gardens, this is one for, or morning sun gardens, this is one for you. In the springtime, it has these sweet little uh, bright, uh, electric blue flowers that are about six inches in height. And then when they fade back, you just um, go in and snip them at the end of their blooming season. It's only in the spring. And then it has that beautiful um, uh, carpet all over uh, your uh, landscape as uh, in the shade areas. Uh, dwarf Mexican petunias are a great little plant. Uh, what they actually do full sun to partial shade and they come in a couple of different colors. Now these are hybrids. The originals are um, about three foot tall. These only get to be about a foot tall. Uh, they spread quite easily. They have pink, purple, and white flowers. And because they are full sun to partial shade, these are great for those of you who are getting the afternoon sun. So you asked about the holly fern. The holly fern is what I would consider a semi-evergreen. Um, it depends. This year it would have done really, really well. Um, I helped to install uh, holly ferns when I was um, helping a friend design his uh, east-facing garden. And for the most part, they do actually quite uh, quite well. We didn't have much uh, frost uh, bite or anything like that. I haven't talked to him <laughs> since the storm, so I'm not sure what they're looking like, having sat under several days worth of deep snow and having gotten a lot of ice on them. Uh, the nice thing about them is, though, that uh, you can just snip off the part, snip off the the, the branch that is um, uh, has any damage on it. 
And as soon as it starts to warm up, they come back. Uh, what's lovely about them is their sheen. Uh, I think they're a very pretty plant. They have a lovely ruffly texture to them. And uh, it is definitely one of the my favorites. We used to have them in our demonstration gardens until we lost um, uh, our canopy and there was just too much uh, sunlight for them. The other fern that does well for us is the southern wood fern. It also is a uh, partial to full shade plant and a semi evergreen. Although I have to say uh, I did drive by a home that had been growing them. Uh, it, it, all around the house it came uh, I think she told me originally from about 10 plants and they looked amazing and she said no they almost never have any dieback they're mostly like this all year round so um, I still classify them though as a semi evergreen and you'll notice that this is one of our Texas natives oh great Tracy said um, uh, mine made it through so I'm guessing the holly fern Nikki said hers came through good so those are two really great testaments that the holly ferns actually survive those uh, five or six days of really uh, um, cold temperatures plus the snow plus the ice and they did okay thank you all for sharing that so some shrubs and uh, this is a beautiful photograph of the leather leaf mahonia usually the leather leaf mahonia for us starts putting out its uh, golden flowers long about the kind of the end of january beginning of february but this year it was a little bit early for us because we never really got that cold uh, American Beauty Berry is a great full sun to full shade, uh, what I call a forest-like plant, I think is the, the right way to put it. Uh, it is a spring bloomer, but the blooms you really won't notice very much. They're very small and they're kind of a pale pink color. What you will notice is when we start to get into the fall, uh, it sets its winter fruit. And there's a couple of different varieties. This is the original, that's the uh, Calicarpa Americana that has the bright fuchsia. Um, uh, fruit, but there, there's also an Alba variety, which is white. Uh, when you get to the winter time or the late fall, it is a deciduous plant, so it will drop its leaves, but those wonderful berries stay around. And uh, we've seen birds, we've seen squirrels nibbling on them, field mice love them. Um, so it's, it's a uh, it's a wonderful plant to put out if you love your woodland nature friends. Uh, coral berry is a little bit more messy looking, but look at those fabulous berries. Uh, it's a partial to full shade plant. Uh, the fruit is in the winter time. It will drop its leaves. Uh, it kind of forms colonies, so it sort of spreads. And I have to say in our old demonstration garden, we had to cut it back every month because it kept encroaching on other things. Uh, but it finally decided that it really liked its shady spot and it spread like crazy, which was fine in the area we wanted it, not fine in the areas where it wanted to encroach. But it's great if you like that sort of forest garden look. It's a really sweet plant, not difficult at all to take care of uh, unless it's starting to encroach, in which case you just kind of cut it to the ground. Uh, dwarf palmettos are a uh, great native plant that it does well in uh, partial to full shade. It, it is evergreen. Um, we say plan for it to be four foot tall to four foot wide, but honestly, in our gardens, uh, it's gotten closer to about five foot tall and easily six foot wide of um, all of the palms. And unfortunately, in this photograph, I do not have a picture of it, but it creates these berries that look like hanging clusters of grapes. And so one of the things that's kind of fun is when we go out into um, the Environmental Education Center demonstration garden is we will see mocking birds having their breakfast and it's really fun to sit and watch them uh, grab a berry nibble on it look sideways at you to decide if they should hang around uh, decide no and grab their breakfast and run although every once in a while we'll get a really brave one that will sit there and we'll just sit quietly and watch him eat his breakfast so uh, I really do like the dwarf palmetto uh, and we actually had a hailstorm a couple of years ago, and that is the first damage we've ever had to our dwarf palmettos. So the ones that kind of got shredded up 
I just cut those uh, leaves all the way to the ground uh, and they have were quickly replaced the following year. But it does require some space for this one. Here is the um, leather leaf Mahonia and somebody said that the Caressa Mahonia is loved by rabbits, which is unfortunate. <laughs> yes, rabbits are kind of the bane of our existence in our demonstration garden too. Uh, but uh, this is also known as um, Oregon grape holly because of the grapes. And so um, it does do that late winter flowering and it has the uh, beginnings of uh, the fruit and it's really quite a sweet plant. This one is the, the color of the leaves is not as dark as ours are. And one of the ways that you can tell that it's getting too much light is the leaves will start to turn yellow. And we did have that happen. And we lost one of ours because we had lost the canopy that was over it. Uh, but we just replaced it with another one farther uh, into the deeper, darker area of the garden. And uh, the rest of them have done uh, quite fine for us. And they are evergreen. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, shrubs, which is an oak leaf hydrangea. I have to admit, we used to have them in our demonstration garden. We've Since we renovated the garden about 10 years ago, uh, the canopy, um, the tree canopy that was over it changed. There's too much light. We tried three times to plant them. The third time that they died, I just looked at my boss and said, can we pick something else, please? They're just not happy here. Uh, and, and they had been happy before. But the light, they, they are a little bit finicky about light, uh, partial to full shade. Uh, these beautiful, beautiful, huge leaves are almost dinner plate size when it's mature. And then you have these very delicate white flowers that just pop against the dark color of the leaves. And then eventually what happens in the fall is it's a deciduous plant, so the leaves drop off, and those uh, flowers begin to dry up, and they almost look like uh, an old-fashioned kind of cream Victorian lace. Now, some people just cut it all the way back to the ground. When we had it, we left it until the spring, and then we would cut it to the ground. That gave visual interest uh, with those little uh, dried-up um, flower bunches at the ends of the, each of the branches. And the last um, ideas I want to give you are perennials. And what I love about perennials is that you plant them now and you enjoy them for a lot of, uh, of years. So um, if you love butterflies, blue mist flower and its um, cousin, Greg's mist flower, are uh, full sun to partial shade uh, uh, perennial that do really, really well for us. And you can see that we've got... Uh, monarchs here on the, uh, and, and also a queen, I think, um, on the sipping the nectar. They are, they definitely are a butterfly attractor. We have an entire island of them. And in a good uh, monarch year, good monarch migration year in the fall, we get tons of them. I think we counted 50 or 60 of them one afternoon, just uh, sitting on the Greg's mist flower. I will say it spreads easily. And uh, that means that you may find yourself digging it out. That's why we have it on an island in the middle surrounded by um, walking paths so that it, uh, it, it kind of stays in place. Another one that uh, we have had in the garden, we don't have at the moment, is coral bells. Uh, some people may call it eucara as well. The lovely thing about uh, coral bells is that the leaves come in so many different colors. Um, they can be caramel colored, they can be deep bronze, they can be striped, they can be many different shades of green. Most of them have flowers that are pink, red, or white. But uh, once those have finished blooming, uh, the, the beauty to it is in the leaf. So uh, we tried to establish a carpet of them with using uh, about three different varieties. Unfortunately for us, that area ended up being just too dry, no matter what we did, and eventually the coral bells died out. So I finally gave up on the coral bells. But we had had them before and they were really pretty. Uh, one of my other favorites is uh, inland sea oats. It's also called uh, uh, fish on a stick because uh, it starts out uh, with little, um, I can't remember what the word botanically is, but the 
what looks like flowers start out sort of a pale green in the spring and eventually through the season they turn darker and by the time we get to the fall uh, you can see that they sort of look like wheat and then eventually the entire plant turns brown we leave it for the winter and then about this time of year we cut it to the ground and it is great for partial to full shade in fact the more shade the happier the plant I have mixed feelings about Lent and Rose. The Hillebores come in lots and lots of different colors. Uh, it is an evergreen, uh, a partial shade. The, I, I have seen other folks have had super success. Mine have been mixed, and it might just be the varieties that I've been picking. But I, because I love the way that they look, uh, we keep trying. <laughs> So think about the Lenten Rose as a possibility. We have two types of columbines. Both of them are Texas natives. This is the red columbine. And the other one is the Hinkley's columbine. And they are full to partial shade. The only downside to them is that they are spring bloomers with a very short season. The upside to them is during their spring show, they make it completely worth the fact that they're only there for about about six weeks, four to six weeks. Um, but look at the intense yellow. And the reason that they're called columbines is because they look like a columbine or a dove. And so you can kind of see that those sort of look like the long beak sticking out. And then there's sort of those little, um, uh, the petals are kind of the um, wings of the, the birds just about to take flight. And I mentioned Turk's cap earlier as a great option for um, both full to full, full sun to full shade. And the lovely coneflower, uh, full sun to partial shade, much beyond partial shade, it won't bloom for you quite as much. This is the original, that's a Texas native. This is the Echinacea purpurea, the, uh, the purple coneflower. They do have all kinds of hybrids in oranges and whites and pinks. And I think there's even a yellow kind of green colored one. And I, for some reason, I think it's called moonbeam, um, but I can look that up for you. When you're selecting plants, I, uh, one thing that I do recommend for you is Easy Gardenings for, uh, Gardens for North Central Texas. It is a wonderful book that you can check out at the library. There's five copies, and it will give you on two pages everything you need to know about that plant. It was written by people in Texas, in our part of Texas, for people in our part of Texas. And it gives you everything you need to know in two pages, which is the best part about it. So I highly recommend this as a way for you to begin to select plants before you even walk into the nursery. So let me see. Um, oh, Carol says, I've had enormous success with yellow columbines, tried the black ones, they didn't work out. Ah, uh, yes, this is the problem I've had. Helibores lay on the ground in the heat of the summer, but otherwise, as long as you water them once in a while, they're great and they come back every year. Um, Greg's mist flower under the magnolia works, a bit of hassle to deal with magnolia leaves covering the mist flower. Yes, we have the same problem that we have leaves that fall down on the mist flower. I just kind of, if they're, if they're covering it too much, I just kick them out of the way. All right, so uh, I see that uh, Kristen has dropped in some additional gardening resources from the library. So we would love for you to uh, look in the chat box and click on that. You can always get a hold of me with, uh, for your gardening questions at seed at plano.gov. That's the Sustainability and Environmental Education Division. It's really easy to just email me. I check our box every day and uh, it might take me a couple of days. If I don't have an immediate answer for you, it's because I am looking for the science-based answer. Uh, so occasionally it takes me a couple of days to get you an answer. Okay. Someone said so the, Google the, Google, the Google Drive has a number of different attack, um, handouts from different classes, but there is a gardening handout there on that page. Great. That is good to know. 
All right. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. If I didn't get to your questions, because we are at the end of our time today, please email your question to me. I know several of you had questions about containers. Um, we might already have a recorded version of our container gardening. Uh, I will double check. Uh, if we do, I would definitely recommend that webinar. It's been a couple of years since we had done it. And I think we still have it um, in our uh, library of uh, webinar recordings. If we don't, and you have questions about containers, you have questions about whether your uh, shade selection is the right thing, please don't hesitate to contact me. And what I love is pictures. Send me your pictures, tell me what your issue is, and we'll see if we can't give you um, a list of some choices that you might make. Fabulous, thank you so much, Erin. You are so welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Well, we thank Erin for being with us. We thank you everyone for attending. We appreciate your being here. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that we do have um, a, an attachment there. It is a, a senior resources um, place that we drop some things, but the gardening resources page is, is on the bottom row of that page. Um, that has some of the other things you can check out and find at the library. And we also have e-magazines, gardening magazines that are available with your library card at no cost. Um, please be sure to stay up to date with the Plano Public Library and our various programs by following our Facebook page and checking out our blog at planolibrarylearns.org. Um, you can also find recordings of past programs um, on through the Library Learns blog or through our, our um, YouTube page. Um, you can find Erin's last program recorded there and this one will, will show up there as well um, in a few days. And please take advantage of all the free resources that Plano Public Library has to offer. Uh, we would also really appreciate your completing our program survey which should pop up following this program because we do value your feedback and it contributes to our planning um, for additional programming. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much, Erin. And welcome. we will see you all next time. There is a link to Erin's next program. Don't wing it. Also in the chat. <laughs>